Knight was still young when the car pulled up in front of an elegant home on Henderson Boulevard in an upper-class neighborhood of Winnipeg known as Westgate. It was a two-story, Dutch-style home, typical of upper-class society. In spite of the lights, the visitors can see that there is no one in the rooms on the first floor. But the man knew better. In fact, you might say that there were more guests than the number of people invited. A little later, I'm the visitor joined a group that was gathered in a specially arranged room on the second floor. Men and women were seated on chairs in a horseshoe pattern. Behind the guests were a dozen or so cameras, all pointed at the group. The cameras were all linked to a remote control button. A small wooden table was placed in the middle of the room. In silence, all of the participants joined hands and pressed their feet against those of the person next to them to form a human chain. The strange seance was about to begin. Oh spirits, friends from the great beyond, do you wish to communicate with us? My friends, are you there? Suddenly a noise could be heard. It sounded like a piece of furniture was wobbling on its legs. As a flash went off, the participants stared in wonder. The table was floating upside down, a meter off the ground. Everyone had the same thought. I hope that picture turns out. In the post-World War I era, as some eight million victims were being buried, interest in psychic research and communications with the spirit world was mounting as never before. In France, the International Metapsychic Institute was carrying out a series of experiments led by Dr. Charles Richet, the 1913 Nobel Prize winner in the field of medicine. In Canada, another physician, Dr. T.G. Hamilton, was also wading into this controversial field of research. Dr. Glenn Hamilton was one of those really interesting people uh, who was born in Ontario, and eventually ended up in Manitoba and uh, became a doctor out there. He had an illustrious career. He was a member of the Manitoba legislature, involved in the medical school at the University of Manitoba, and probably Canada's most famous psychic researcher in the 1930s. A friend of his, Dr. Abbott, who was at the University of Manitoba in the English department, went down to the United States to see a phenomena uh, uh, that uh, where, where a woman through Ouija boards was receiving uh, information from a woman called Patience Worth. And over a period of time, this Patience Worth translated from the other side, from the spirit side, whole books, poetry, novels at a tremendous rate. Dr. Abbott came back and talked to Hamilton about it. And I think that was in 1928. And at that point, the spark of interest happened. Thomas Glendening Hamilton became interested in psychical research because his son had died as an infant around the end of the First World War. And I believe that he was not able to get over the death and so ended up investigating life after death in order to find out what had happened to his son. Hamilton set up a laboratory in a large room on the second floor of his home on Henderson Boulevard. He was aware of the importance of taking photographs during the seances. They would be vital to supporting his research. Hamilton had arranged a series of cameras along with automatic flashes that would be able to be set off in the complete darkness to try and record some of these manifestations. Some were stereo cameras, some were uh, arranged to take different perspectives, uh, some were attained, arranged to take specific close-ups, but the idea was to try and photograph these manifestations in complete blackness, and was able to produce some remarkable photographs of objects apparently emanating from the mouths, the noses, the ears of, of the medium. 
This element is ectoplasm, a substance that is given off by mediums and which makes up the human body and various objects. In the 1920s, Hamilton and his colleagues studied all phenomena associated with spiritual communications, but especially manifestations of ectoplasm. Abiding by his own rules, Hamilton only called upon non-professional mediums, volunteers that he knew personally who agreed to abide by all of his control measures. Upon arrival, the medium would be searched to make sure that no strange substances were being brought into the laboratory. Once inside the room, the medium asked to hold the hands of the individuals sitting on either side. For the duration of the experiment, the medium's hands never left those of the guardians. And while the medium was in a trance, spirits would manifest themselves by means of ectoplasm. I think part of the attraction is the picture itself. There's still a profound respect for the picture that's worth a thousand words. And people believe pictures. I, you know, you see things in the exploitive press, and as long as there's a picture there, people will believe. He was a doctor. Doctors had a profound position in the, in the community, and still do, as people of honesty and integrity. He was a member of the provincial legislature. And so, in effect, I think he, he himself was believable. The fact that he dealt with photographs meant what he researched could be looked at and separated from him, and, and, the, and, and the picture itself became the statement of his truth. Uh, and he was allowed to do this research without personal attack. Between 1928 and 1933, T.G. Hamilton organized dozens of such seances. Guests came from all over the world to attend these experiments, including novelist Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who created the famous Sherlock Holmes, and William Lyon Mackenzie King, the future Prime Minister of Canada. It wasn't just lawyers and doctors, as we know, were involved, but it was also even the Prime Minister of Canada in the 30s, when William Lyon Mackenzie King, in the, in the uh, early 30s, became interested in the question of survival and the spirit communication. Although the seances and the photos convinced Hamilton and his companions that the soul lives on after death, many believe that his experiments were just a hoax. I think it's quite clear that Hamilton himself believed very strongly, and I don't think that he would participate knowingly in any fraud. Some of the photographs look extremely suspicious, and uh, certainly there is uh, the notion that there was fraud going on in this, the, uh, those circles, of um, investigative circles at that time. He was serious about what he was doing. He tried to do uh, the investigations with very strict scientific methodology, and yet one must wonder from looking at some of the photographs and the, the samples of writing that were produced, uh, why uh, some of these things that appear to be hoaxes or could be easily hoaxed were believed so intensely by the individuals involved. All of the people who were involved, directly involved in the research, were convinced of the authenticity of the research, including many years later. Uh, in some cases, 30, 40, 50 years later, people were still writing positively about their experiences. number of other prominent physicians and politicians who were involved and testified that uh, the mediums did not appear to be bringing anything into the room, nothing left the room, uh, the room itself was secured so that there was no possibility of someone entering and depositing something that could be uh, taken out later and, and pretended to be a, a manifestation. So there were some very good scientific um, uh, restrictions and uh, some good methodology in trying to study what was occurring to prevent hoaxing and yet the possibility of a hoax can never be ruled out. At the end of each seance a record of what was observed was signed by all of the participants. It seems highly unlikely that all of these individuals would have signed if the seances had been a hoax. Skeptics claim that it would have been more worthwhile to get a sample of ectoplasm for analysis 
rather than simply photographing it. They also question why mediums no longer produce this ectoplasm that used to be so popular. Teleplasm was a very interesting uh, phenomenon. It's wide, it was widespread at the time that it was in vogue, if we might say that. And um, oftentimes the, uh, the teleplasm would have images of uh, people and things inside uh, the teleplasm. Um, now I think uh, the people look at the teleplasm and it looks completely ridiculous. Today we, we largely want to be entertained. We've become used to the radio, the television, and most recently video games and the internet. And to sit night after night, week after week, for months on end to develop this type of phenomenon is extremely boring. And this is what the, the mediums, the Hamilton mediums reported. They, they were bored. They did not want to continue meeting for such lengths of time and not really knowing what was going on. They weren't aware of the phenomena that was being produced in many cases. I think the fact that so many of these effects such as automatic writing and uh, ectoplasm and teleplasm can be duplicated by stage magicians uh, uh, has uh, sort of put these uh, on the back burner. I think because they can be easily duplicated and can be so easily hoaxed that people want more solid physical evidence.